Communities exist. Communities want to do things together. They need a medium to do that. Hello friends, Jess here from C Club. Welcome to season three of Building at the Edges. We host conversations with the top innovators, thinkers, and builders at the intersection of crypto and community. I'm very excited to bring you this conversation with Jacob Horn, who's the co-founder of Zora, who's formerly at Coinbase, where he helped lead the USDC partnership there. And Zora and team have most recently released Nouns Builder, a tool that allows anybody to spin up a Nounish DAO. Jacob's also a very big participant over in the Nouns DAO ecosystem. So today we speak about Nouns DAO. Uh, we go deep and pick apart the Nouns DAO model with Jacob and why it matters. Zora is making a big bet on the Nouns model. Jacob explains why he has confidence in that, why he's so excited about it, and the approach they're taking to step into that ecosystem. We start talking about why NFTs are a better form factor for ownership in a community or organization than ERC-20 tokens. And we wrap up talking about the risks Jacob sees when launching a project in Web3, a very relevant conversation given the days that we are in today. I think it's very hard to leave a conversation with Jacob not excited about the potential that DAOs and nounish DAOs and Web3 can have. And I'm sure you'll have that experience here as well. So let's get into it. Here's my opening question for you is, what is giving you the confidence and maybe excitement around this new model to literally put millions upon millions of dollars of value, mm -hmm. years of your team's time into this new direction? The simple answer to that question, I think it's like, a, it stemmed from a gut feeling that has been building since I saw it. It's been well over a year in, and it's typically, I think in crypto with like such fast moving cycles, you know, I think you'll have these moments of elation and then a month or three months or six months later, that elation will disappear as kind of the, the hype and excitement comes off in the moment. This is, I think, the third time I've had a feeling like this. The first being Ethereum when I first learned about it. The second being Uniswap when I first got my hands on it, where it's just like, oh, there's something fundamentally new and powerful that comes with this model. And I think over the past year of kind of becoming part of the ecosystem and contributing to it and understanding the tech, realizing that like, oh, this is a model that has, I think, empirical legs now. And then two, I think can be applied much more widely than just the Nouns DAO itself from the protocol up. When I started talking about it to the team internally, I met with confusion and just like, okay, Jacob, like we've heard this kind of stuff before, but then it just... <laughs> Uh, it's like, uh, this will just be another crazy Jacob thing. He's a torpedo the whole roadmap and, you know, rinse, repeat the chaos, all that kind of stuff. But I think as we started to articulate what it was doing, what it is, why it might be important, and then, you know, having the nouns now kind of like, I think empirically validate a lot of that stuff out in the market made it where we are today, where we're making these big moves, but they feel so high conviction. I think we've stress tested the logic so many times where it's like, okay, like, it's an exciting moment, but we think it's the right thing to do. And we're just going to run full speed ahead into it. We're not going to half-ass it, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, that feels like a really high level and kind of hand wavy answer, but I think that's kind of where we're at. Well, I think these moments in startups are that they, they all kind of feel like that, right? Like the best moves, the best pivots, the, whatever you want to call it, come from a haze of feeling and some data, but if there was perfect data and it was proven, the opportunity to really lead here would be gone already. So I identify with that feeling deeply. And I want to get into like some of the specific pieces because I think like probably the highest value we can provide to people here is like, what is this? And I think there's yeah. just this general, like that idea of most people don't quite get it. And then I think there's a level of getting it, but then I think there's this next level of getting it, which is where you've helped sort of pull me in the last little while, which shows that this is far more extensible and powerful than I think what is even being demonstrated right now in, in Nouns DAO. But I think it's probably helpful just to zoom out a little bit. How does somebody get to this sort of level of conviction? And I think when I look at your story and just the things that you've been working on, especially in this DAO space, and we can go you know right back to even before we met, which was yep. long over two years ago or 42 decades in the crypto space. <laughs> it seems like I just see such a consistency in the threads that you're pulling here. So I don't know where we want to start. I mean, I think St. Fame is like a, a useful place here, but if you want to start a bit before that, really curious about like your conviction in on-chain organizations, DAOs, and why you've been doing what you're doing at Zora and, and making this move mm. into more of a DAO tooling, I guess, if you will, that you're doing today. Yeah, okay, let's start right, right, right from the beginning then. We'll go from first initial idea that got me into crypto into like why noun styles probably are the best form that gets at that idea. So I think first heard about Bitcoin, it was my first year of computer science in Sydney, and this is 2012. 
And the thing that really sparked it was not Bitcoin itself. It was that like, hey, here's how you can create your own cryptocurrency or your own currency for anything. My mind immediately jumped to, I was like, oh, so you're telling me you could create a currency for any idea this easily, which means that people can organize anywhere around the world using the internet at its core and you have a value system that allows for that. At the time, I think the language was, well, that I was using was like, oh, it's kind of like crypto equity in like a project. So instead of having to create, you know, an Australian company, which I was like, ah, oh, you know, that, that doesn't sound that exciting. Uh, you could create a, you know, an internet organization that can do that same thing. And there was this thing called Counterparty at the time, which were early attempts at tokens. They were like called colored coins built on top of Bitcoin. Couldn't really do anything with them because Bitcoin isn't particularly programmable as most people know, but they let you create a token on top of Bitcoin, which was like a big deal. That was really hard. And then around this time, Ethereum was being spoken about and eventually released. And it immediately made sense because I was like, oh, I understand creating tokens, but you can't program them. Now you can program them. So I was like, holy shit, this Ethereum thing's really cool. I'm going to attempt to build this on Ethereum with this, like, this is my final year of college. It was like a project called Horizon, which was like, oh, create crypto equity for any creative project, be it a, you know, a film or whatever. And I was kind of tweeting about it a lot and just writing about it, sharing designs. And that kind of led to me being at Coinbase. So I moved from Sydney to San Francisco. And then Coinbase was this whole kind of own story. A lot of work, crazy amount of company growth, like it, the company grew from slightly less than a hundred people to a thousand people and it just, everything was blowing up. But I guess towards the end of my time at Coinbase, Unisox and Uniswap came out and that was mind blowing to me because I was like, wait, this isn't a crypto thing at all. I'm looking at a pair of socks. This is like fashion that is now finding its way into this medium. That's really exciting because I'm like, oh, this is a creative project using crypto in a new and interesting way. And it was like, oh, wait, you're telling me that Uniswap gives me the entire power of Coinbase in like a single function call and offers better liquidity at this scale. I was like, oh, this will disrupt Coinbase over the next like five years. And I was, you know, I was like, holy shit, this is cool. But that kind of put me on this thread where I was like, well, if I can create a token on a trustless protocol, that means I can push trustless this one layer up into the DAO side, which is kind of what put me into the same fame headspace, which was, okay, I'm going to create a shirt, long sleeve shirt, release it Unisoc style, but I'm going to nerd out and make a permissionless brand and DAO on top of it, which is what led to same fame. And the kind of funny thing about that was that you know, I was using Aragon at the time. I tried really hard to tie every aspect of the Uniswap pool and the token to be as as trustless as possible and no one gave a shit about it. <laughs> Everyone was just like, this token side's cool. That was kind of the starting point for Zora, which is like, okay, the kind of pattern in our mind was community DAOs doing creative things. And we're going to start with the creative things piece first, because that's starting to work and has sparks around it, which sent us on the NFT journey. And I guess the whole mania for NFTs, I guess the 10K PFP boom happened. That was interesting because, you know, the 10K PFP was a new format. I think it was the dominant format of that mania. Everyone who was creating and seeing success in that mania were creating 10K PFP projects. But I think there were some like systemic and structural issues with that, which was on the one hand, collectors were misinterpreting what they were buying. They thought they were buying into a project or like a startup essentially, but in reality, they were buying an art object. And I think communities and collectors felt, you know, rugged because they would see teams then raise at insane valuations, which they would have expected the, the NFTs to be. And then not only this, it's like, well, if you're holding one of these NFTs, you've stuck in this tragedy of the commons, which is I don't necessarily have the individual means or incentive to spend tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to advance this project by putting up murals or doing marketing or merch drops. You kind of are at the whim of this third party team that has all of the ETH, which is why we saw the devs do something meme kind of be the meme of the mania, because it, I think it was perfectly emblematic of the structural issues. Amidst all of that, I think the Nounsdow project had the initial seed of an idea from Punk4156, which was, well, what would CryptoPunks 2.0 look like to address some of these structural issues? How do you create a very simple system or organization using NFTs at their core and align incentives so these NFT communities can start to do things together 
in a on-chain and effective and simple way, and crucially being incentive aligned to do so. I think where people often get stuck and where I found myself getting stuck when looking at nouns was looking at it through the lens of an NFT collection versus looking at it through the lens as an organization. You go to the page and you see a ridiculous price for an auction and you're like, oh, this is just like another NFT PFP project that's going to do its thing and I don't care about it. But then if you click one level deeper on the DAO button and you start looking at the proposals and what this organization is very consistently doing, you understand where that ETH is coming from and how it's controlled. You're like, holy shit, this is really, this is insane. This is like a subreddit with a shared bank account that's just able to run and do its own thing, which I guess, what's the thread? I think I was like, oh, wow. Like I was kind of jealous when I had that realization. I was like, I wish I had built this because I feel like this is the purest instantiation of this like thread of ideas that I've been running through crypto for, for like almost a decade, I guess. That kind of landed me at like, oh, Nouns DAO as a form factor is, I think, squaring away a lot of the structural issues of the prior mania that we saw and is offering like a really fascinating and expansive idea for what organizations could look like in the future. And it's a really simple model. So it's like, yeah, that, that's kind of where we're at. <laughs> So I feel like there's two fun paths for us to go down. One is like the functionality and expansion and sort of like the tool set that's embedded in there. But I think there's like a challenge that I run into and in sort of explaining nouns is one that I would say is more embedded in sort of like the deep financialization of crypto so far and edging towards what I would say is more of like a culture or meme, I think is probably just the best way to, you know, word to co-op to a certain degree to sort of capture this value. And, you know, I think there's many folks looking at like, you know, what's the discount of cash flow of a protocol? Can I turn fees on a protocol? Like what are these very traditional financial models? And yet sort of on the edges, we're seeing in large part from the growth of NFTs, but I think definitely announced out and further. And, and even in the broader crypto space, you still look at the top 20 cryptocurrencies. There's a number there that are still purely meme driven and I will not be convinced otherwise. So I think there's like wrapping one's head around this idea of cultural institutions being investable or this new type of formerly illiquid or illegible value mm -hmm. actually being captured by something like nouns or NFTs or tokens more generally, I think is a thing that you almost like it's helpful in, in fully understanding the breadth of possibility here. And so I know I've had the privilege of just pulling on your brain threads a lot lately. And so again, thank you for your amazing two hour session on our SEO five chat the other day. But I love this sort of explaining the value of nouns through the lens of sort of fiat alternatives, or at least even in comparison to something like Uniswap, I think like showcasing mm -hmm. why an ownership structure, an NFT, or owning part of a cultural institution might be actually a stronger, pure investment thesis than something that is maybe a little bit more financial. Yeah, I'm not even sure investment's the right word either. Maybe I'll describe the nouns model as simply as I can, and then I can like build out from there. So the nouns model works as following. You have an NFT that is minted each day. It can be a unique NFT that is generated on the fly. It could be the same image being minted each day. It doesn't really matter. But what's interesting is the ETH from that auction goes directly into a treasury. And that NFT is one vote over that treasury. So on day 10, you'll have 10 days worth of sales in that treasury with 10 votes of people who can control and allocate that treasury together. And that basically puts you in a position where because there's no other ESC20 token or anything else, everyone who holds that NFT is aligned to do the same thing, which is how do we further this organization and increase the value of the NFT that we know is going to be sold tomorrow. That like predictable and known dilution kind of creates this incentive that kicks the community into gear to do something and further the NFT, which, you know, is an artwork or I think meme is a great word. So in the nouns case, like their core meme is these like nouns glasses that they have on the artwork. And a lot of that treasury spend is like, how do we further the meme as far and wide as possible through art and marketing? But more interestingly, how can we start to fund new public goods or infrastructure or tools and products that have the nouns brand on it, but are offering really valuable online services and eventually real world services as cheaply or as freely as possible using this economic model to its advantage. And I think it's hard to find analogies for it. I think like Red Bull might be the closest fiat analogy we have where, you know, they have created this incredible brand that they then use to sell and monetize through, you know, drinks that that commodity, but also 
by creating other assets like a Formula One team using that brand and like kind of feeding into the machine that furthers brand, which lets them do bigger and more interesting things in the real world. Another kind of recent example could be like Mr. Beast, where it's like create video, take all capital from that video, do a bigger video, keep building up, capture as much attention as possible, and now start working backwards into the real world through Mr. Beast burgers or drinks and other fashion or whatever it might be. This, I think, is like a simple crypto model that gets into that same behavior and makes it much simpler for anyone to do that or like crucially let, let you do that as a community instead of necessarily an individual in that case. So it's like a meme machine might be the best way to describe the nouns now uh, or the simplest way. It's like insert meme. People can organize around that meme and have the incentive to proliferate that meme through more memes or actually doing really good things that people associate that brand with, which I think starts to push us into the, well, that's how public goods and public protocols and all these types of dynamics play into it because you realize you can build good brand by doing really good things for the world, which is kind of interesting and get an economic reward for it. So I guess that's a, a rough cut of like, well, that this is kind of the form we're playing with and some of the incentives and dimensions that come with it. If people aren't following you on Twitter yet, you have to sort of see this like real time exploration here. And I think some of these threads of like, like what would Uniswap look like with a slightly different dynamic, either with NFTs or, or with you know, different incentives built into that protocol that are treating it like a public good rather than, you know, so I'm getting ahead of myself in the various things I want to talk to you about. A question <laughs> that I get often is sort of around like, why is the NFT a better form factor for ownership in a meme or in a community than an ERC-20 or a fungible token? Why do you think this is like actually a, a meaningful advancement in how we're representing ownership in memes? It's a really good question. I think the simplest like three IQ answer is you can see it. <laughs> and we associate the value of the token to the image instead of the other way around. So it's like if you have an ERC-20 token, you're primarily caring about, well, what utility or financial utility is this token explicitly tied to? And the token, the image icon that comes with that ERC-20 is the secondary thing, not the primary thing. In NFTs, the image is the primary thing, and that's what the token actually derives its value from. So that simple inversion is a really big difference because that means that the token can derive value from furthering and making that image more famous and more widely spread. So I think it more fully captures brand value or meme value in ways that I think fungible tokens can, but not to the same extent. I think they're a bit more leaky, but that has huge implications because it kind of changes the economic model of the DAO if you like go a level up. So if we think about a Uniswap DAO or a Compound DAO or like name your DeFi DAO, it's very hard to imagine those DAOs funding like, hey, let's put a hundred foot unicorn statue in Central Park. The DAO might go, that's an egregious marketing expense. Why would we do that? How does this increase the value of what we're doing and therefore give us more capital to advance towards our mission? But in the nouns DAO, that exact proposal makes perfect logical sense because it's increasing the attention. The token derives its value from that attention, which then means it gets more capital to either do more memeing or more making. So it's like, it's a very different bottoms up starting point to build a DAO, which I think has implications for the competitive dynamics of DAOs, especially ones that run these protocols, because I think a lot of protocol DAOs currently have to sustain themselves from basically fees from the protocol. But these protocols run at zero cost with zero headcount. If you have a DAO that has now got alternative ways to get capital outside of the protocol themselves, they may always be able to offer that protocol at a lower cost or free and be able to keep advancing themselves as a DAO, which I think is something that I'm really interested to see how that plays out. And if that's a true thing or not over the next like couple of years, as I think we start to push the boundaries of the model. So yeah, NFT DAOs, I think, can base their value a lot off the brand and meme and attention they gain it. ESC 20 DAOs maybe can to some extent, but not to the same extent as NFTs. Yeah, I think it, it's also interesting to think about how, because you're sort of talking about like the product or the unit of creation or a uh, value, which is the token. And then you're also talking about the organization that is sort of birthing mm -hmm. these things. And, you know, for early stage builders, there's, there's sort of the paths forward, both from a legal structure and a financing structure. And like, I, I love the word primordial ooze, like the primordial ooze that these things sort of emerged from actually has such an impact on what yep. ultimately gets built. And so traditionally, in many ways, the path would be to go raise money into an equity based organization, a labs type structure, and for that yep. lab stripe structure to go do development and eventually launch a protocol, maybe airdrop tokens and sort of distribute value that way. Like using the Uniswap example here, that's kind of what they were maybe 
forced into doing or had planned all along, but ultimately mm -hmm. ended up doing. And, you know, I think a lot of the threads I see you pulling on around nouns is almost like suggesting that this is actually a, a new and different starting point. So I'm curious if you can sort of pull apart, like, what are the issues with the, that are maybe embedded in, in the labs type structure? And how do you mm -hmm. see maybe launching DAO first or as a nouns DAO, I'm solving some of those? When we look at DAOs to date, I think they've created really good tokens that can capture at least some of the financial value of the thing that those tokens can govern and control. But we haven't necessarily seen organizations, sustainable organizations, be built and created that results in DAOs with high proposal velocity doing more like new and novel and interesting things as a community that's separate to the labs. I think when looking at the nouns DAO, if you like click on that DAO tab and you compare it to every other DAO in the space, there is clearly something magical happening, both in terms of the model, but obviously the people and context around that DAO, which means that you have a sustainable and very thriving organization that is running entirely on chain. And that kind of speaks to the thing I was saying earlier, where it's like, it's much more interesting to look at nouns through the lens of an organization than an NFT collection. So how that plays into the labs dynamic and everything that comes with that. I think we've experienced this as well at Zora and we kind of, I think this has been part of our excitement for the model because it's like, oh, how can we break out of this labs model? I think the labs model puts you in this local maxima, which is you can move really quickly. You can get a lot of capital from venture capitalists. You can work in public, undistracted, have heavily opinionated like decisions, all that kind of stuff. But the entire ecosystem and internet essentially is relying on that one team to push everything forward. So you have a single point of failure, a single point of failure. And then also like it creates this context where no one really wants to advance or contribute to that protocol or ecosystem because this official team exists. Not only that, we're now in a position where I think you see a lot of labs teams post token raising huge amounts of capital. And then it opens up a question where it's like, well, how do I relate the value of the DAO to the increasing value of this labs team, which is now building platforms on top of it? And like, I think there's tensions that could arise from there, you know, with a big asterisk where it's like, this is all new. Everyone I think is operating with the best intent they can. It's just like, these are hard models to play around with. But I think what, for, at least from our perspective with Zora, I think it's like, okay, as we need to move into an on-chain organization of some kind, how do we make sure we don't create just a flat token that captures the financial value? How do we actually start a viable organization that can advance and build in this ecosystem? And how can we be on equal footing with everyone in that ecosystem too? And I think the NounsDAO model feels like a compelling option there because you have a treasury that's occurring ETH that's not just holding tokens. It's able to capture the brand and the medic value of what you're doing and then the kind of one NFT, one vote system, I think lowers the barrier to entry for things to be proposed, which means it's much more contentious and requires work. But I think the velocity and output is much higher. And then if you compare that just to like, I think the multi-sig approach that a lot of teams take, multi-sigs within ERC-20 token and snapshots don't necessarily scale very well outside of the core contributing team, or they haven't proven that they can do that yet. So this lets you start small and eventually grow into that scale versus, you know, starting multi-sig and then having to find a way to transition that into a context which lets you, lets you expand out of the core starting group. So yeah, they're kind of like three, I guess, different parts of the playing field. It becomes even more clear in like the, I mean, it's like all those sort of compelling cases, but you, you look at some of these NFT projects that have, again, had large run-ups, whether it's a doodles or a proof, and there's a ton of perceived value in holding the NFT as the, the core asset of participation in this ecosystem. And then this labs type structure goes out and raises a bunch of money. And I don't think it takes too many leaps of logic to see that potentially there will be interest diverging there where you know value mm -hmm. is trying to be driven back to equity investors versus to token holders. And we sort of skipped over some of like the stuff that you shared previously around this evolution of Zora between like selling physical products that were backed by NFTs and to just purely NFTs. And I think the argument there, which I think is really strong, is that this is sort of like the hard application of tech. What is the, the net new thing that can be created here and, and that has like more of an exponential growth potential than maybe an iterative approach that is more constrained with, with certain things? And I, I see that as being kind of 
core to these two organizational types. Like one, clear leaders working, values being created. You can't ignore that. But like, what are we not seeing built on those structures? What is being held back? And I think that's harder to see. And thus maybe doesn't come into the equation as we're sort of valuing or seeing the potentials here. But I think it's the smart people, and at least the one that I feel very compelled to make as well, is, is that there is there's this more meta layer that exists as we continue to build out crypto. And there are going to be these DAOs and ecosystems, these networks that truly have scaled to a level of what an Ethereum or a Bitcoin has today and and that are going to be able to do much more complex work than maybe purely what is being done on chain right now. So I guess I'm curious because we've seen you as a prolific public worker start to publish stuff around hyperstructures. Um, mm-hmm. And also, I think, you know, Zora as being sort of this open protocol that allows sort of anybody to come around and, and fork that code and kind of be mm-hmm. Uh, at the same level that you are tech-wise that you sort of spent many years building. How much of those sort of like fundamental structures that you sort of see developing have led you to believe more in sort of this path that, you know, nouns as like a unit of account or central organizing structure is valuable? Yeah, I guess two things. So something you were saying earlier, I think it's, there's always something exciting or intriguing when I think a piece of technology becomes kind of like a Rorschach test where people have so many different interpretations and struggle to find the language and there's contention around what's actually happening there because it's like, oh, that's usually at least one sign that there might be something net new because it's hard to put your finger on it. So I think that's just like kind of like a meta point totally. here. But I guess like what, yeah, how did the hyperstructure, I guess, writing and thesis play into this? The simple answer is, I think this is the value system for hyperstructures. So I think probably one of the boldest and most contentious statements I made in that essay, which I think, you know, got a lot of critique and questions. And, you know, I think it's still 50-50 split, at least in my very probably biased network, was I said that I believe that hyperstructures can simultaneously be free to use, but extremely valuable to earn, which is totally like, uh, like, the best analogy I can come up with is like, it's the Mona Lisa. It's like the Mona Lisa itself is not extracting revenue. It exists as an object. It lives in the public domain. It's printed, it's reproduced, all this kind of stuff. Yet we assign very rich and exorbitant cultural value and therefore financial value to this thing. Protocols on Ethereum exhibit the same traits. They don't require any maintenance. You can deploy them once, zero headcount, and they will keep running and they can run for free because they do not have the maintenance cost required of a team you know keeping the servers up you can defer that to the blockchain so they can run for free forever so then the question is like well what's the value piece and i think if you look at the kind of v1 dao model which kind of has a resemblance to traditional maybe public stock markets which is like oh you have this like fungible ownership that gives you maybe some governance rights and you have to associate it with like revenue and cash flow and all this kind of stuff i think the nouns model with the i guess mimetic value capture at minimum means that okay like maybe nouns branding a protocol is enough goodwill and branding and notoriety to then increase the mimetic and brand value of the nfts at large so it's like oh okay like it doesn't need to extract fees from the protocol to create and gain value. It actually needs to fund and create really valuable free public infrastructure and own and govern and control that because that governance and control and then the recognition for doing so is enough to sustain the organization because it has an economic model that allows it to. So I guess when writing the hyperstructure essay earlier in the year, I guess that was kind of, I was like, well, there is a logical extreme that exists here that these things can run for free with zero maintenance. And we've got inklings of a value system that says that we can say that those things are valuable. What does the DAO piece look like? I think this is that DAO. This is at least a very compelling DAO option in that case, more so than what I think we've seen in DeFi DAOs. And then not only that, I guess, what kind of informed that thinking was seeing Nounsdow quite literally fund new forms of public infrastructure in the form of like Prop House and Agora and all these interesting tools, or even protocol developers and becoming an alternative to the Ethereum Foundation in a lot of ways. It's just like, oh, like there's clearly something that's like working in that vein. Like maybe these two things together make a lot of sense. So yeah, I guess that's how the, that hyperstructure style thinking and maybe hypothesis then played into like, well, maybe this is the DAO counterpart to that thinking. I love it. I think that's really helpful just to put those things next to each other. Because I think they sort of complete, yeah, the critiques of, of each model almost sort of get solved by looking at them side by side. 
So, okay, I want to dive into some of like the expansive opportunities that you see within nouns. And, you know, I think you did a good job earlier sort of taking a time out and explaining the basic functions of a noun style DAO. So this is this daily auction, all the ETH um, from that auction goes into a treasury, which full stop right there is actually a meaningful difference from most other DAOs that have to, you know, do private token sales, etc. And then sort of one token equals one vote and the almost to a degree, I guess, announced concentrated ownership, but also accessible ability to post proposals sort of leading to this more widespread use of those funds and, and also like a higher velocity of proposals and thus, you know, theoretically better ideas. And then also back at all this within the, the broader terms of like mimetic value being a thing and this being a pretty clear tie in to that. But I think like the, I was there with you on nouns months ago, right? Like I got that. I think my biggest shift in the last little while has been to move from this place where I felt like it was actually a very constrained model to one that actually I think has a lot more optionality or extensibility than I first recognized. So I think it'd be super valuable for us to kind of pull some of those ideas apart. Like you sort of used in some of your posts recently, this sort of multi-sig versus nouns doll is almost like the same level of primitive that exists, a mechanism for generating capital that can then be invested into the growth of a thing that can be co-owned. But I think a lot of the powers of a, a multi-sig and even a smaller team that's maybe sort of has a lot more influence in it is that they can get things done faster. They can have a lot of optionality, you know, as the space is moving so quickly, they can kind of like, yeah, have optionality as that evolves. And I think one take is that, you know, if you're looking at a nouns down model, you're really baking in some really core pieces that might in some cases feel like you're actually giving up a lot of that optionality. But mm. I don't think you hold that point of view. And so I would love for us to sort of dive down that thread. Okay. So I think like most projects, be it art or building something, like everything starts with an idea. And then it eventually finds some name and some logo. And I think in crypto, in a lot of cases, that's starting a Twitter profile. And then eventually, if you keep believing in it, you're building a community, like eventually you might get to a point where it's like, oh, I'm going to get some capital and start a company around this. I think the NounsDAO model can actually sit at the exact same time that you start a Twitter profile, which is like, oh, there's this core idea, or, you know, meme is another word for idea, basically. There's this core meme that I'm trying to get at. I'm going to create a nouns DAO around that could be a simple, you know, it could be the same statement minted every day to start like a hidden superpower of nouns DAOs is that they can change and upgrade their art over time, both retroactively and forward looking. So what you start with doesn't have to be what you're left with. I think what, instead of starting a multi-sig with some friends, put the idea out there make it as public as possible. And then anyone that that resonates with, they have a way to start to participate directly and like get ownership in that idea itself. And then, you know, that community as it starts naturally building, instead of going through this kind of great filter of maybe the team wants to do that particular idea or instantiation of the idea, or they don't have the time, you can actually start moving into a kind of plural mindset where you may have multiple people cooperating, competing, under the same idea, but all of the value capture can start to accrue in that greater organization and it can fund multiple instances. So you as the creating team, as that idea and the meme starts to spread out, you're starting to capture that value. And then you're no longer worried about forks. Those forks are additive because provenance is this kind of magic thing means that like, well, the original idea that was put out there captures the value the more it's copied. So you may have your lab team being funded by that same DAO, but the DAO that you're a part of might also vote to fund a different team to work under the same idea in a different instance, but that's net positive to everyone in that ecosystem. And then on the kind of autonomy or opinionated decision-making side, I think what we've seen in Noun so far is that the Nounders are a heavily opinionated group. One, I think they have the status within that organization as the founders of it, where when they want to pass something, you know, it goes through a vote and sometimes it's contentious and it might not go through, but more often than not, I think it does go through. But then also they can just get funded and go work on their particular pocket that doesn't have to go through vote every time. So it may be like, hey, 4156 has an idea for a documentary that's going to be produced by stupid buddy production studios a thousand eth goes to them as a team and they're able to take it and run with high velocity with that opinionated decision making whilst everyone else in the ecosystem has that same level of autonomy under that shared idea so if you compare that to a multi-sig the multi-sig means that you will probably have less public governance work we almost certainly will but you're trading off public contributors having the incentive and the avenue to contribute from day one so in the multi-sig construct, I think you get fork and that's a bad thing. 
in the noun style construct, I think you get forks, but that might get funded. It might fund forks. And that's a really good thing. Yeah, I think this idea of actually like sort of fun, like because coordination is the core challenge in these organizations, right? And I think there's this, the, the broad belief in DAOs is that or upside there is that, okay, we can actually have large numbers of people coordinating on these initiatives. And I think what you've sort of seen in, in more of like the multi-sig structures is that people are either trying to like overly complicate coordination. So there's these weird points or earnings or like how does value flow in and that needs to kind of get baked in, or you end up with sort of maybe one team that's actually doing the, the vast majority of the work because they have all the information context to be able to go make those decisions. The knock on it has always been that, you know, great products get built by small teams with a strong vision, the ability to coordinate and move fast. And I think that's very true. And I don't think DAOs change that in other ways, but what this model does, it could exist in the multi-sig model as well, but it seems to really have taken hold here is this idea of saying, all we're doing is funding great ideas that support the development of the meme and all that coordination work ideally is being done by expert small teams that have high social yeah. capital proof of doing it before and, and can go do the hard work of coordinating and making something that's valuable in a way that ultimately flows value back to the organization as decided by those voting. So you get this type of coordination happens on the meta layer and is not needing to be structured on the more micro layer on individual initiatives. Exactly. Maybe a way to say it is that you get coordination around the high level idea, but you can have competition or co-opetition at the instances of the idea. Like you have multiple interpretations of the idea itself. And then, yeah, you can have fast moving teams like the prop house team, which is probably built one of the highest impact products in crypto in the past year, were funded by nouns, they received a grant, and they've been able to run at full speed using a thousand ETH in funding, they tap into the community whenever they need to or want to. And you know, they can get more funding in the future if, if they achieve this, the goals that they set out to run with. And I think like we've actually seen this in certain mandates from nouns where they'll fund multiple teams competing for the same goal. So it's like, oh, we're going to do four grants of 50 ETH for teams that are going to build their own version of a third party front end. So it's like, you can kind of get into this plural mindset. I guess like cooperation might be the word. It's like you're competing on some level, but cooperating yeah. at the high level, which is the idea. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. And I mean, it's led to some just incredible problems directions that have come out of that and a lot of diversity there in, in the, the explorations, which again, you know, compressed in a traditional product roadmap or sort of brainstorming or execution in a, in a specific team. I think the other piece there that you know, many folks that are building DAOs, there's this tension between broad community ownership and participation and control, maybe is the right way to look at it. And I think if you're like investing your heartbeats in this, I, you know, I think ideas are valuable, obviously, execution needs to come with it. And I think entrepreneurs, in many cases, want to maintain this feeling of control or ability to kind of direct their vision in many ways. And so I think that is why this labs model or even a multi-sig in some cases is appealing. And, and then, you know, I think I've framed it in the past as thinking about like almost curation of who can participate versus who can't and thinking that, you know, maybe on the extremes that both work, but that for many types of, of projects, having being curated and who comes into the community and who contributes is actually a valuable thing to both allow you to run fast, but also to almost build up the value of that network. But I think that in your answer around sort of the social capital that lives within some of the founding teams, I think, and I know from previous conversations, that there's actually a high degree of that influence embedded in the social capital that lives in these organizations, that it's not fully recognized or at least embedded in the ownership of those organizations. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's true of most DAOs. Like if Robert Lesher at Compound or Stanley at Ave or Hayden at Uniswap, come forward to the table with something isn't outright egregious, most likely the, the people going to default to trusting that vision as the creator of these things. So yeah, I think I think that's, that's a fair statement to make for, I think in this context, but I also think it's true in a lot of other DAOs as well. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. So there's, there's a couple directions I've seen you playing with on the internet recently around uses of these models in maybe non-traditional way. I always love using non-traditional as it relates to something that's been around for a year, yeah. but I'm going to use it in non-traditional ways. One of the features I see that you're really intrigued by is this idea of these nouns, DAO structures, being able to issue other additions or other tokens. And I'm curious mm -hmm. like why you see that as such a superpower and, and maybe what you might see that being used for. I think it's harking back to the Saint Fame DAO and create it like an objects image in my head, which is like, okay, like if you think about pick your brand, like take nouns is like Nike, the overarching brand. It's like, well, why wouldn't it be able to drop collections in this context? Because there's very clear legibility between am I buying ownership in the meme and the brand or am I buying something created by the brand? 
like now that we have a growing language between these two things, you can start to play in both, I think, really effectively, which is like if there was a proposal for an X copy times nouns or ferocious times nouns collection dropped via nouns itself, I think that would be one insane moment. But two, it's like, I wonder what art would be funded and created in that context. And I would be pretty sure that a lot of people in both the nouns ecosystem and that artist's community would probably want to buy and own that work. So it's interesting. And, and then I, I think like nouns model aside, I actually think this is where we can start to see really interesting experiments around new types of public funding models for art generally, which is, well, imagine, I'm just gonna use really like schemorphic language, but I think it'll help. It's like, imagine you had record label DAO, which is, it has a name, and then people are organizing around this idea where it's like, oh, we really wanna fund and proliferate the best hip hop we possibly can. And this is the organization that's gonna do it. So there are now proposals, which is like, oh, we funded this artist 100 ETH to go spend six months creating the best work they could. We love it. Now it's going to be released as its own NFT collection under this label with splits back to the artist. But you can start to see a body of work form from this DAO in a way that's very simple and very cohesive, which is like, oh, that DAO did really well. It had great curatorial taste and it funded that artist. They produced work together. That work was sold, which is now interesting because maybe there's now ETH going into that treasury outside of daily auctions so it can move even faster at like funding more artists to produce more music. But I think that like that is like a really interesting machine where we can start to decouple the NFT for the brand having to do everything. And the DAO can actually start doing more things and acting as a collective entity on chain like an individual would. Like there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to connect nouns to super rare, try and mint something. And then that goes to a proposal on chain that people go like, yeah, we want to do that or no, no, we don't want to do that. Like these DAOs can do things other than just fund. They can actually carry out on chain actions like mint or create a drop and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's why I find that really exciting. I think, yeah, that's the optionality that I think really started to unlock things in my mind. Cause I think like the ability to like, essentially what you're, you're making a decision to, if you're building a DAO, you're not building a company. Right. And that's and what that means is that you're building in this on chain world versus an off-chain world. And, and you're betting in many cases on, you know, the future demand, but also a feature set that is going to be rolled out by the entirety of the crypto space continuing to, to innovate. And so I think this idea of, you know, being able to, it's compelling just to be able to interact with the existing smart contracts that exist out there, but also having that ability to interact with whatever future ones come, I think is a thing that in, in my mind really reduces the sort of the risk when you almost close off optionality that, you know, may come from making some of these structural decisions. And I don't even think it's you're starting it down on a company. I don't think it's that. I think you're starting it down. You may be starting many companies. Companies. Mm. Like I think it's yeah. I think it's yeah. like oh like if this DAO likes this team who is doing a traditional company and that company is going to work within the boundaries of the brand or the meme or the mission, there's no reason why that DAO wouldn't also try and contribute capital to one or many companies. So I don't think it's a trade off of DAO or company. I think DAOs are fundamentally this new thing that can now start to relate to and lead to many different companies in many different countries. Um, so I think it, it does do that optionality. A wonderful distinction. It solves many other problems that many people building this space face around paying taxes for say, like what a, what a novel idea. Okay. So there's two things I want to get into before we close out here. The first, I think one of the first noun style DAOs to be built on nouns builder is from the Farcaster community. It's called mm. purple DAO. And I think it's interesting because what we saw there is a community launch a DAO for a community that's playing on a protocol mm -hmm. and that there isn't actually a direct tie-in between those two, right? So Purple DAO, which is exists to build the ecosystem within the Farcaster ecosystem, which is sort of like a Web3 Twitter-ish. Maybe that's not the social protocol for those who haven't checked it out yet. Essentially, you have this nouns mechanism that has I think, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in the treasury right now that is going to be directed towards building out this ecosystem, but it's not actually coming from the Farcaster team. It's not coming from mm -hmm. the Farcaster investors, not directly, at least maybe somebody has bought one of those tokens. It's an interesting twist, right? Like, first of all, one might say like, why the hell is somebody actually putting their money on the line to go do that if they don't have core ownership in Farcaster? And yet there's been compelling demand there. I'm curious what you sort of see, like, is that an emblematic of like, maybe more nuanced approaches for how these tools will be used? I think it's a window into the future. And I think it's like, I'm just so happy to see it so early because I think it's starting to like prove a lot of the 
hypotheses coming into this, which is communities exist. Communities want to do things together. They need a medium to do that. So it's like the Farcaster community have already been building on the protocol. There's like a rich ecosystem of apps. The community want to see that happen more. And the team is so heads down building out the platform on top of it and all that kind of stuff. They only have so much time in the day. So the community exists and they want to do things. And then two, a meme exists, which is like, if you're on Farcaster, you'll know that People are like, oh, this is more for Purple app than the Bird app. So like the Farcaster app versus the Twitter app. So like Purple and like Farcaster has a very distinct Purple that they chose for their icon. Purple is a meme and as an idea and as a symbol and as a stamp basically on all of these third party apps we're seeing is an immediate identifier that's part of the Farcaster ecosystem and built on the Farcaster protocol. So I think it's like the two magic ingredients there is that okay, there is a community that wants to do things together. There is a meme that they're identifying with and organizing under what's the medium which allows them to do anything about those two things. And I think the nouns DAO is exactly that. I guess the really important part is that like in this model, the DAO accrues capital based on those two things. Is there a good community? Is there a good meme? Is there a good desire to do things together? So even though it's not from the Farcaster team at all, you could argue that purple as a meme is now ownable. There is a community that want to do things together that can organize under it. And now we're only six days in and we're seeing tens of thousands of dollars in a treasury from the most avid contributors of that community who can now go, oh, let's spend $10,000 funding developers to build this type of application or this type of infrastructure on this open protocol. Or let's fund more people to build awareness for Farcaster on Twitter and build the community that way. And this medium has allowed for them to do that in an economic and very tangible way outside of the team the Farcast team themselves, which is awesome because it's like, oh, you have the labs entity doing their thing. And now you have the community self-organizing and able to do things on top of this protocol that they have belief in, which is yeah, wild. Fascinating. Like, that's totally insane. But it's like, holy yeah. shit, it's kind of working, <laughs> which yeah, is cool. Super wild. One of your recent tweets, I'm trying to see the present through rose-tinted glasses. I think our conversation here has been one of rose-tinted glasses, or at least hasn't shown some of like the underlying uncertainties or questions that exist. And so yep. I think it, it would be helpful for us to sort of explore, like, where does this go wrong or where does this not work? What are like the deep risks that are associated with maybe transitioning to this or launching a project in the space? I'm curious, like in your moments of doubt, where do you see that doubt living? Yeah, I guess a few considerations and then I think things where these could go wrong. So I think considerations, one really important thing is like, just because you start a DAO like this doesn't mean it's going to be successful. That's like thinking just like starting a Twitter profile or, or an Instagram page or a company immediately means the thing is valuable. Like just starting the thing doesn't mean it's worth anything. So I think that's really important context to set. Open questions and failures. I think there is friction and like these DAOs are very public and entirely on chain, which is a superpower. But the responsibility that comes with that is that anyone who owns an NFT could literally put a proposal to take all of the ETH at any moment. So it's like there is a awareness and I guess like there is labor and work that comes from these organizations, which is like, okay, like it's all on chain and all to play for which means it's all to play for and you might have people who like come for that treasury. So I think that's like an area where it's like, well, what tooling's required and UX is required to make sure there's notifications. What smart contract tools can we build to automatically defend against malicious proposals and stuff like that, that may try to exploit these types of DAOs? So that's an area. So it's like, yeah, these aren't free DAOs in a way, like they require labor and work to create value, but also to protect that value. So I think that's, a, that's important. And then the third is, I think it's still an open question if these DAOs can sustain themselves purely on meme value alone. Like in the same way, Red Bull has a valuable brand, but you know, sells millions of cans of Red Bull and builds a Formula One team in business or Mr. Beast, you know, starting to kind of traverse back into the real world through Mr. Beast burgers and all these different things. Like, to what extent do these DAOs actually have to do something <laughs> that isn't just creating more uh, like, and that, the, and that do something could mean like, maybe they actually have to build products or protocols, or maybe it is they're on this kind of treadmill of having to create more drops to keep advancing themselves on the assumption that, you know, these are one a day forever. Like you can make a DAO that's only one a day for 30 days. So like, I think there's a medium to experimentation to play there. So I think that's like another area. I think that's actually a huge one. Like, is this meme thing real? Or is this just like a one year suspended animation thing that's going on? And then for 
yeah, I guess it's like the model just doesn't doesn't work outside of Nouns DAO itself. Maybe Nouns DAO is just this like one-off magical thing and that's all that's needed from the DAO and then Nouns is just going to keep proliferating as an entity, but maybe it doesn't work as well for other organizations, period, would be another, I guess, known unknown. And then I guess like number five would just be like, there could be smart contract bugs, there could be unknown loopholes or unforeseen incentives that start to play out as this gets way bigger and way more complex as an ecosystem. So there's always that underlying asterisk where it's like, hey, the whole thing might just have a bug that blows the whole thing up. So I think that's a, an area too that I think worth paying attention to. So yeah, those would be probably the main ones. I mean, I think that's going to be the interesting stuff as Nouns continues to evolve this, you know, the idea of bribery or vote buying. And, you know, there's like all these social attack vectors that we know exist in crypto generally that I think, I mean, there's obviously contingencies built into their structure that kind of supports or, or safeguards that to a degree. But I think it is going to be interesting to see the best and the worst of people come out in a very public way in these things, especially as they become very, very valuable organizations. I guess one of the questions I have, when somebody's putting capital into a project, in many cases, they are viewing this as an investment. And I think many people who are buying nouns are are doing it with at least that assumption at one level. And, you know, the nouns model, I'm just curious, like, do you sort of see is one of the failure modes here that these tokens are not valuable on secondary, and therefore, there is an exit liquidity for people who who are maybe investing in these things. And, and you know, just to put a finer point on it, like you have investors and you're making a bet on, on sort of making this move. And so there is like, clearly this is not just about, you know, doing good for the world. It's probably trying to do good, make fun things. And also that there's a, a profit incentive behind it somewhere. So is there a risk in that these things aren't going to be valuable in the future in, in their current structure, just given the daily dilution that exists? For sure. I think like one way to look at these is like, maybe these are internet alternatives to foundations as well so maybe it's like maybe this is less a labs alternative this is more a foundation alternative which is like there are people in the ecosystem who have the capital and the desire to support that ecosystem to you know create you know we, we talk a lot about i think in this conversation like public goods and artistry being the things that are being created here maybe that's the extent of it where it's like okay you're essentially contributing capital to an organization that's supporting both of those things with the mindset that this is a public goods institution that's going to fund public infrastructure and the arts. And maybe because of the way that NFT works, that means that these things can increase in value over time in the same way that an artwork would. But looking at it through the lens of a company or like a project or a startup, I think that's a known unknown and an open question. And it's like, we don't have any examples to point at that. I think we only have the public goods funding angle to look at right now. I think inevitably we will, we will see people trying to come at this medium from the purely financial startup mindset. But I think a lot of what, well, well, I guess nouns now, I think more sits in this kind of public goods funding mindset. And it's like, maybe this is a new way to create these types of valuable public institutions versus private institutions. That would be like my thinking there. But I think we'll probably see people try and come at it from that angle. And it'd be really interesting to see that experiment play out. Is that not the angle that you're coming at it from? No, I think the angle I'm coming at it from is like, yeah, how do you help the public do public things together? And I think that looks takes the form of public protocols, which we care a lot about, and then artistry, which is what we care a lot about. And it's like, okay, now you have new ways to fund more art and do more things together that could probably be as free as possible or cheaper than they've ever been given this economic model. I love pushing on this point here with you. Which I guess maybe to answer the question, maybe that means the value of the thing goes up. Right, okay. Because I feel like there is that underlying piece here because to me, like the most exciting part about these new organizations organizations is the ability for any, you know, like right now, human creativity and even participation in, in just in networks in general is, uh, and the ownership in networks in general is just limited, right? Like the existing legal structures do not allow for that to happen. And it's created an immense amount of inequality in the world. I think that's like a fundamental piece of the inequalities problem that we have today. And so like my core interest in this new technology is one around that if we distribute ownership to people who create value or care or contribute value to these networks, that that collective action will grow in value. And I guess I was trying to sort of pull apart whether you share that view or not. And I think, I mean, we've talked enough where I kind of think a sense of where you're coming from with that. Uh, but, and I think it is kind of, yeah, it's not helpful to look at this sort of, you know, foundation or company is, is probably separate in this case, right? Like there, there's probably actually a, a blending here that you see taking place in ways that maybe new projects will have to explore a little bit more deeply given that Nouns is very effective at generating meaningful treasury value on the meme alone, but maybe that doesn't continue over into to all other aspects. Where should we direct people? What's new and happening in your world that people should go pay attention to? Check out nouns.build.
that's where you can create one of these dance DAOs. You'll be able to see a whole bunch of people experimenting with it, get a sense of what the communities look like. And then if you're looking to learn more about nouns generally, just go to nouns.wtf and go to the DAO page and read through the proposals because yeah. you'll be mind blown. You'll see funding nouns figurines being sent up to the International Space Station. And then five proposals later, it's like, oh, let's fund you know, clean up and charity in parts of Africa or even in like, you know, anywhere around the world. So it's like, there's all sorts of stuff that this organization's doing. And it's like, yeah, I think it's, it's like looking at a subreddit with a bank account and that bank account happens to have $50 million in it. It's totally insane. So yeah, they're the two places to look. Yeah. I also think jumping into the prop house, the announced prop house is also a great example of seeing just the, the ways of which funding is being released and the cool things are being created. So all right, man. Appreciate that. Again, appreciate that you did your hair for me today for this call. It will be you know, not video, just audio. So I'll say Jacob's hair looks phenomenal. He's not wearing a hat today. It's a big day. And yeah, just really, well, you know, I always profess my gratitude to you for the, all the support you've given to C-Club along the way and the continued inspiration that you drive here. So thank you for sharing that with us today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's great to chat. Hello, friends. Steph here, media team steward at C-Club. If you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review Building at the Edges. This helps other Web3 builders discover these valuable insights. And tell us what you think on Twitter. Tag us at at CclubHQ. Thanks for listening. See you on the internet.